Uh, thank you, Axel. That was a terrific talk, Marty, and I'm sure we'll have a lot to talk about after this brief presentation. So uh, these are my disclosures. Uh, uh, you know, talking about, I think, uh, you know, we've talked about this ad nauseum, and the incidence of stroke is not trivial. In this meta-analysis, the overall stroke rate was 3%. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at this uh, large data set, and as was mentioned earlier, this is uh, also important because it actually affects uh, mortality at 30 days, which was actually four times higher in patients who um, had stroke. And of course, the definition of stroke varies. So when you look for it, you'll actually find a lot more stroke. So if you look at work definitions, the stroke rates may be 3%, 4%, 5%, 6%. 6%. But when you start looking, whether, whether it is with modified Rankin score, NIH stroke scale, or uh, uh, assessing cognition, you can actually see how the stroke rates actually do go up. And at 30 days, the stroke rates were as high as 15% looking at the AHA, uh, ASA, American Stroke Association definitions. The important thing to mention here is that the stroke rates are similar across the surgical risk spectrum. So this is the large data set, German data set, from almost 20,000 patients. The overall stroke rate was 2.3%. But if you look at the intermediate risk, high risk, and low risks, there's actually no difference in stroke rate. So this is independent. And if you look at the TBT database, what is very clear here is that over a period of the last few years, we have not really decreased the incidence of stroke rates, at least in the TBT database. So I think uh, there, is, there is a need to actually address this issue. So, you know, the question was, I'm, I'm just going to show you some cases. So here is a 72-year-old patient that we did. Uh, you know, his EF is 15%, uh, and he's got critical aortic stenosis, and you can see something there, right? There's a big thrombus in the left ventricle, right? So this was easy, but unfortunately, we did not have uh, the uh, Sentinel device available at that time. So we did this as compassionate use. We were done enrolling in the study, and this is a patient who was able to have safe TAVR, um, you know, without any stroke, and then uh, has an extremely well, uh, and, and I just, uh, you know, wanted to, this is a patient testimonial that was actually used during the FDA hearing, and in fact, if you look at it, uh, you know, this patient mentions, I thought this, was, this would be appropriate considering the stormy weather that we had uh, last evening here in Chicago. The patient writes, during this time, my stormy skies cleared up thanks to an umbrella type device which captured a blood clot and gave me my life back. So <laughs> just to, uh, so we've incorporated, uh, you know, assessment of um, the aortic arch, uh, you know, as a part of our workflow now. And this is, uh, this is a patient that we did last week, once again, an 89-year-old patient who was randomized in the portico study. So here is the filter. So irrespective of patients being in clinical trials, this is the standard of care at our institution. And uh, this is the placement of the portico valve with excellent result. Here is yet another case. Uh, this is the retrieval of the device. This procedure takes about four to uh, five minutes at the most. So th this is another patient uh, which we did using the right subclavian approach and, uh, you know, the filter device was deployed and was safely done. So applying, you know, some of the data that were presented here, you know, these are the stroke rates going down from 9.1% um, to 5.6%. I think that's the important data. The reduction in periprocedural stroke rates down by 63% from 8.2% to 3%. And looking at this data, you know, if you apply that math to our program, we can say that these the difference of 5.2 when it is translated into what it will mean to our program with 600 TAVRs in 2017, there will be 31 fewer strokes. It will cost us more money. And uh, we hope to actually uh, save that money by actually, uh, you know, cutting cost in other places. Uh, since approval in the last two weeks, we've done 26 TAVRs, and we use the filter devices in 20 cases. And there is seamless integration in workflow and procedure. So it doesn't seem to really affect the procedure time. And this is, this is the data from the Sentinel trial. In fact, the average time there was about four minutes. This is our report card from the Sentinel trial in our first 49 devices. That we actually used with 100% device deployment and with very little increase in procedure time. So this is clearly something that can be integrated into the uh, protocol. We hope to replicate the results that have been attained by the investigators. I think these data are very inspiring and I think make a very, very strong argument uh, regarding the path that we have chosen, which is to use embolic protection device in a routine fashion. 
Uh, much has been said, and you've seen this slide. I think we, 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 it, is, it is upon us to actually reduce cerebral injury with this life-saving technology. So I'm going to skip this slide, but uh, you know, uh, go ahead and actually not only, not only is stroke important, but also is neurocognitive decline as we move into younger patients. So uh, you know, I hope uh, you know, I've, I've conveyed to you our approach of how we have very early on in the last 10 days since the device has been available, we feel that we've actually integrated into our practice. Thank you.